Good afternoon, everyone. Our next session is Building Infrastructure Resilience Through Microgrids. Our moderator is Jake Gentle. Let me give you a brief introduction to Jake. Jake is a senior program manager and power systems engineer for Idaho National Laboratory's National and Homeland Security Directorate. Jake leads and develops technology and provides technical oversight by coordinating state-of-the-art and innovative solutions for a host of organizations and offices within DOE, DHS, and DOD, as well as several electric power industry partners. Since 2009, Jake has led multiple programs focused on the secure inter integration of clean energy technologies. Now there's a lot more to say about Jake, but I think the point here today is to get this panel up and running. So Jake, I'm gonna turn it over to you and let you take it. All right, thank you, Sherry. And Jake, you should have uh, uh, screen sharing capabilities if, uh, if you want. I will launch those right now. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. I uh, appreciate this opportunity to, to put this panel together. I think it's been uh, actually a pleasure to meeting some of the panelists. Um, Michael and Josh are two that I had not met before, um, but at the end of the day, I've heard a lot about Colonel Perkins and uh, Megan works uh, on our team and I'm getting to know Megan a lot more. So. Welcome everybody again, like I say, this is the Building Critical Infrastructure Resilience Through Microgrids panel. Um, I'm gonna somewhat be the moderator, but I think our panelists will uh, clearly speak for themselves as they go throughout. I've got a couple canned questions that we'll be able to bring up if we need to. Um, but I wanted to start off with introducing the panelists. Uh, first off, Megan Kohler is a power engineer and cybersecurity researcher, kind of a double major, uh, expert in both fields, if you will, um, here at Idaho National Laboratory. Uh, Megan received her BS degree in electrical engineering from Texas A&M and a master's degree, uh, again, in electrical engineering from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, Megan joined us here full-time in 2021, but she's had a, an on and off internship career and graduate fellowship program uh, at INL for the last couple of years. So, uh, a major highlight that happened this week is something I want to really point you to at the very bottom here, which is um, Megan is currently participating in what is called the IEEE USA Competitive Edge Campaign. Uh, she filmed uh, a couple different segments yesterday with IEEE videographers here at INL. Uh, so we're excited to have her highlighted um, as an INL employee, but really just congratulate her on, on some of that uh, accomplishments. Uh, the next panelist will be Michael uh, Lightman, uh, coming to us from the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association. He is the director of system Op optimization. Uh, I, I love that title, Michael, and I, I look forward to hearing more throughout this panel and then obviously working with you uh, in other projects. But um, Michael's got a great background and I love it because one of the projects that he's managing uh, is called Radwind. Um, it's a project funded by the Department of Energy, and uh, unknowingly or knowingly, we're also a collaborator on a couple other efforts uh, between INL and, and NRACA. So we appreciate Michael's contribution to this space, and we really look forward to um, how NRACA is, is viewing microgrids and their, their contribution to resilience. Sec uh, third here uh, up is Colonel John Perkins. He's the Director of Construction Management and facility management within the facility management office at the Iowa Army National Guard. You know, I gotta, I gotta say something here, Colonel Perkins. I, I got your email saying, hey, I'm not able to join this uh, practice session here. I'm, uh, I've got this flight thing, I've got this. It's, you know, uh, and it just blew me away a little bit because I was like, are we at war? Is he, is he, is he in active duty? Is he really, you know, flying this thing into battle? And, and so it just kind of brought me back to reality of uh, people aren't just sitting in national labs or, or industry doing research and papers. You're out there living the stuff you're working in. Um, so I look forward to your conversation here. But basically, you know, as a graduate of the US Army Academy, 
or Army Command and General Staff College. Um, your, you know, your Master of Military Arts and Science and Strategy is something I'm extremely excited to hear more about. I think the strategy part is something that uh, we can leverage uh, future into the, you know, into the future of how microgrids play into this. Um, lots of information here, and I'm not going to try and explain it because it's impressive, and I'll do it no justice. <laughs> Uh, the fourth panelist here is Josh Mousey, Senior Manager of Grid Innovation, Grid Edge Innovation at Southern Cal Edison. Uh, Josh, you know, you, you came to us uh, via some excellent colleagues, ones we've worked with for many years, and now I'm really excited to have another point of contact at Southern Cal Edison. It's a, it's a utility that we all, you know, love to partner with and collaborate with, and here at INL, we've done that year over year. Um, but your background and your focus on grid edge innovation is something I'm extremely excited with. Now, since joining Southern Cal Edison in 2014, you've been able to kind of hold several positions uh, in strategic planning and management. So really, we look forward to, to how you're going to translate that into to microgrids and the discussion here about resiliency. So I shortened up some of your descriptions. I'm going to apologize right now, but I feel what we're going to hear about is, is even more impressive. So um because it's your words not mine uh but i wanted to start off with this graphic uh, i spent a little time searching around what is the standard definition of a microgrid or how might people think of microgrids there isn't one uh, it's really your perspective um and i wanted to offer up some graphics only just as a backdrop uh, i don't anticipate walking through each graphic or describing what i think a microgrid is because i want to turn it over to the panelists uh, and I want to let each one of you kind of offer up some perspective. I know you've got some talking points and I've got some questions. Uh, but to start off with, Megan, I'd like to see your perspective on um, your work at INL, your past work at the university, and just in general, um, what is a microgrid and how does it relate to you? Thanks, Jake. I wasn't expecting to kick it off, but I'll take my stab at it. Um, I think to me, the core parts of a microgrid are the local generation assets and the local use and the ability to be disconnected from the grid. Um, in some of my work in solar and wind, you know, I've seen more and more this kind of definition of microgrid around renewables. And I think it's important to remember that it doesn't just have to be uh, renewables only. Um, you know, we've had microgrids for a long time using diesel assets and other things. Um, not to say that we shouldn't be looking towards that cleaner energy future and how we can use renewables to support local communities. Um, but to me, the, the microgrid part of it comes from um, the ability, the you know, distribution level system. Um, I don't have any particular size requirements in my work when I think about microgrids. Um, and I think there's also kind of a growing smart grid component to microgrids. I think the ability to intelligently manage um, your loads and, uh, and your generation assets is important, particularly for these smaller systems. When you have the bulk of the grid behind you, you, know, you might have a little bit more room for error, um, but at the microgrid scale, there's um, more requirements to intelligently manage those assets. Also, since you may be limited in your generation power, um, just the ability to intelligently deploy those, um, you know, for maximum utility, I think is important too. So I don't know if that's a solid definition of a microgrid, but there's my take. No, I definitely appreciate that input. And I know, Michael, you were going to kick off some perspective from the NRECA angle in terms of uh, how you've viewed microgrids and how you implement or, or are looking to implement different technologies. Um, do you mind giving us a perspective on it? Yeah, absolutely. And I uh, apologize. I think I'm juggling three screens. I'm going to share some slides. And uh, if you see my eyes shifting or uh, if it takes me a second, just bear with me. Um, let me. So, Michael, while you're pulling that up, if, mm -hmm. if our uh, tech moderator can send out that first poll, I think we'll let that one sit up for a minute. Uh, that'll give us an opportunity to see who, who our uh, attendees are. Yeah, go ahead, Michael. All right. Uh, and I'm also going to be sharing some links in the chat, uh, which I think will go to everyone, which I think is the right setting. So, again, bear with me. Um, let me move that. 
All right. So uh, before I go into microgrid specifics, I just want to give a little background on uh, NRECA and our members. Um, America's electric cooperatives, uh, electric cooperatives are not-for-profit, locally owned and governed, uh, member-owned electric utilities. Uh, there are over 830 across the country. Use uh, electric cooperatives as a shorthand. Most of our distribution members are electric cooperatives, but we also do have uh, some other rural utility members, uh, mostly public power districts, um, especially in the state of Nebraska. Uh, we serve 13% of US electric customers of all types, uh, residential, commercial, industrial, uh, and about 42 million people um, in 48 states. This map, you can see our footprint. Um, to serve uh, all those people, uh, we own and maintain 42% of the nation's electric distribution lines with an average density of eight customers per mile of line compared to 32 for the rest of the industry. So that just really reflects the lower density uh, in the areas we serve. Although there's a, a lot of uh, variation um, of our membership from less than a thousand uh, members to, to several hundred thousand. Um, members also serve over 150 military and Coast Guard facilities, including 33 full uh, utility privatization contracts to own, operate, and maintain uh, base infrastructure. This is just a different overlay. Um, most of our members, about 80%, are uh, member owners of generation transmission cooperatives. These are wholesale utilities that uh, these distribution utilities have banded together to create. Uh, they're generally governed by uh, board of directors from those distribution members. Um, very significantly across the country, but they provide wholesale power uh, using both owned generation and aggregated wholesale purchases. Uh, and some are really purely uh, purchase aggregators, others have significant uh, uh, generating resources and it, it just kind of varies. Um, many of uh, these GNTs are also members of organized wholesale electric markets. And the other 20% um, get their pow power from other, uh, other entities. Uh, in the Southeast, that big kind of gap you'll see are about 50 of our members that get their power from Tennessee Valley Authority. Others, especially Pacific Northwest, get power from federal power management uh, agencies, um, and then others have bilateral or, or bi multilateral uh, wholesale markets that they access for their wholesale power. Getting into microgrids, um, you know, looking, looking uh, historically, uh, co-ops have a long history of, of serving isolated grids. Now, these are kind of what you might call natural microgrids, either an island or uh, an off uh, isolated grid in, in Alaska. Uh, where you know, they really are the whole electric system. They've got to balance supply and demand uh, to provide reliable electric power. Um, but they're not part of a larger grid. They're not island in for a larger grid. They are the grid. And I'm going to share just a, a couple of examples of these. First, um, uh, Jake, thank you for mentioning the Radwin project that I manage. Um, this is focused on distributed wind deployment uh, in rural America and by our members. Um, but microgrids and hybrid uh, deployments of distributed wind are, are definitely of interest. Um, this first link I'm gonna share is for a case study we put out uh, late last year on Kotzebue Electric Cooperative uh, in Alaska. Uh, most of these island, these island locations have rely, primarily relied on diesel uh, for generation in the past. It can be very expensive. Um, obviously, uh, uh, Kauai uh, Electric um, is, is in Hawaii long distance to ship diesel. The Alaska co-ops have long distances and also weather challenges, for instance, uh, frozen water uh, part of the year in their ports. Um, so Kotzebue is just a good example. They were early pioneers in adding wind generation to reduce their uh, need for diesel. Uh, over time, they've added several kind of generations of, of turbines getting larger over time. Uh, they also added battery storage more recently, and then most recently they've added some solar generation and plans to add more wind and more battery storage over time. So really, you know, they've got to maintain reliability there uh, and also uh, improve uh, economic performance by offsetting expensive diesel. Um, Kauai is the second that I'll share, uh, just an article that just came out uh, or uh, uh, coverage from, from NREL. Um, they have been pioneers in uh, shifting towards renewables on their grid uh, to reduce diesel load. They have a wide variety of resources. Uh, historically, they've had hydro and some biomass. 
They've added significant amounts of solar, uh, including more recent projects that are solar plus battery storage. They're working on a solar plus pumped hydro storage project. Uh, and really of interest there is the uh, US Navy specific missile range uh, is in Kauai. Uh, and they've recently worked uh, with other stakeholders to deploy a microgrid to serve that facility. Uh, it's got a lot, fairly large 14 megawatt solar array, 70 megawatt hour battery energy storage system. Uh, during normal operations, that just feeds into Kauai's grid. Uh, but in emergencies, the base facility can isolate. So that's the largest clean energy microgrid currently that, uh, in a DOD facility. Um, looking at grid connected microgrids, there, there are more emerging across the country. Several are online or planned. Um, and these use a variety of technologies and use cases. Just to highlight some, uh, serving critical loads on islands. Uh, these wouldn't be islands like Kauai, but islands that often have like a single submarine cable coming in to provide power that could be vulnerable to uh, weather or other uh, outages. Or uh, a lot of co-ops um, are either wholly or have portions of the territory that are really at the end of like a single radial transmission line that might be vulnerable again to weather, natural disaster like fire uh, or other uh, challenges that can put out the power uh, that could make uh, microgrid for resiliency attractive. There's some instances of commercial and agribusiness uh, microgrids partnering with a, a commercial member to deploy a microgrid to uh, improve resiliency. And finally, as I mentioned, uh, serving military facilities. Um, and also in emerging use case, we were seeing two uh, residential subdivision microgrids that have recently been deployed in North Carolina. Um, so I'm just gonna share a few links. First, North Carolina's electric cooperatives. Uh, they've been a, a real pioneer the GNT there, North Carolina, North Carolina Electric Membership uh, Corporation, uh, has worked with several of their members to deploy five microgrids uh, at this point. Their first was Ocracoke Island, which is uh, at the south of Cape Hatteras. It's only accessible by ferry. They have a submarine cable that can go out in hurricanes and other uh, physical outages. Um, so they took an existing diesel backup there, added some solar and battery storage, a microgrid controller, and demand response using controllable water heaters and thermostats. And that allows uh, maintaining critical loads during an outage. Um, and they've, they've had some success in doing that. Um, a second uh, type, again, serving commercial or ag facilities is uh, uh, they've worked with one of their members and a pork producer. Um, and this one's interesting. It combined existing resources they had, a uh, swine waste uh, biomass digester generation, diesel backup, and uh, the, the local co-op, um, uh, South River EMC, added solar batteries and a microgrid controller and can maintain uh, resiliency at that facility. Obviously, they've got to keep uh, cooling and, and functions going in the event of an outage to protect uh, their, their animals. Um, two uh, microgrids have recently been deployed serving new subdivisions. Uh, one of these was the first in the state. Um, in Brunswick, excuse me, South River EMC's territories, sorry, Brunswick EMC's territories, uh, 30 plus homes, residential rooftop PV, a larger centralized community PV array, uh, controllable thermostats, water heaters, uh, optional uh, EV charging uh, that can be controlled, um, and microgrid controller. Uh, so all that can make a more resilient uh, subdivision. Um, and then a second project is also uh, just came online um, with another subdivision that uses a, a large, larger scale propane generator, uh, EV chargers, uh, microgrid controller, and all this allows resiliency for those neighborhoods. Uh, and finally, there's another aggregate business um, project in the way, uh, in the works with a uh, egg producer, Roseacre Farms in Tideland EMC's territory. That's a two megawatt solar array with a battery, uh, battery system and a diesel backup. And that's actually, um, NRCA project is working on that one, so I'll mention that one again later. Um, one more, I'm going to mention just a few more briefly. Uh, Orcas Light and Power uh, in Washington State serves the San Juan Islands. Uh, these, again, uh, similar to Ocracoke, uh, they use a uh, submarine cable that can be vulnerable to outage. Um, so they're deploying, they've got one microgrid already deployed on Decatur, which is a solar plus battery storage microgrid. They've got a second in the works on San Juan Island. Uh, this is helping them to defer um, upgrades to their submarine cable 
and also provides resilience for those uh, areas of critical loads in the event of an outage with the cable. Um, Anza Electric Cooperative in California, uh, they're a member of a GNT. So in, again, I mentioned North Carolina. Uh, in several cases, the GNT Cooperative is involved with their uh, distribution co-ops um, in deploying these projects uh, and supporting them. Um, ANZ is a member of Arizona Electric uh, Cooperative, a GNT base in Arizona, but they're actually on a transmission line um, from SoCal Edison, uh, goes across desert area, uh, areas that are vulnerable to uh, wildfires. Um, so they already had some solar installed. They've added additional solar and battery storage system. And that's to maintain uh, critical loads in the event of a long-term outage, especially if that transmission line goes down. Um, and, and really of importance there, they're reliant on uh, well pumps for their water. So this can help uh, keep the water system going along with other critical loads. And then if an outage is going longer term, they're planning how to use rolling, uh, rolling blackouts to, to move across so everyone can get some power when needed. Um, finally, I'm gonna talk about one more, uh, Poudre Valley uh, REA in, in Colorado. This is again, another project that NRECA is involved with. Uh, they serve a uh, small mountaintop town of Red Feather Lakes. Uh, they are at the end of uh, one uh, radial subtransmission line that can go down during uh, bad weather conditions or with physical damage. Um, and that uh, added a solar array and battery storage uh, at the local library and fire station can maintain emergency services, uh, broadband, um, shelter, meeting space, food, et cetera. Um, so that's you know kind of different different looks at the ways that co-ops are deploying microgrids at different scales. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, appreciate that, Michael. And um, you know, sounds like NRACA is only working on a few small things, um, and you guys need more work to do. Is that is that kind of what we're hearing? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to share just a few more things and I'll, okay. I'll get out of the way. Um, this is just uh, one more link. These are projects that we currently have ongoing in the microgrid space and some tools. Um, the Rural Energy Storage Deployment Program is deploying batteries uh, for microgrids uh, to serve critical loads and maintain resiliency uh, to establish best practices. Two of these I mentioned, the Poudre Valley Project serving uh, Red Feather Lakes and one of the North Carolina projects serving the egg producer. The other two are at a DOD facilities, uh, Sand Hill Utility Services serving Fort Bragg and West River Electric serving Elf, Ellsworth uh, Air Force Base. Those are, should be coming online by the end of this year. Um, so this is an interesting opportunity of using a DOE and DOD partnership. So deploying energy infrastructure at uh, military facilities. Um, microgrid up, uh, UP standing for utility privatization is looking at some of these uh, UP projects, uh, Rio Grande Electric Cooperative serving Fort Bliss and Laughlin Air Force Base in Texas, uh, Chelco serving Eglin Air Force Base in Florida and Sussex RAC serving Picatinny Arsenal, New Jersey. And this kind of goes hand in hand um, uh, with, uh, with our ESDP. It's using our open modeling framework, which was developed in earlier DOE uh, research projects um, to uh, create a planning tool uh, for microgrids uh, at these critical facilities, focused on uh, military bases right now, but the lessons learned would be applicable to other large commercial industrial uh, and critical loads. Um, tool can tell you what, you know, on your worst day, how many hours can you sustain island uh, tell you um, how you make it work, microgrid work through different scenarios, what balance of technologies would be most economical and effective. Uh, it's not a full design tool, but it identifies cost scenarios and others. Uh, and gives due diligence tools for going to engineer developer to develop a microgrid. Uh, this project is in the alpha stage now. The beta should be rolled out soon and it's wrapping up 2023. And one other project, the uh, rural uh, operation of network microgrids uh, is also using the OMF. And uh, one, um, these all kind of interlock. So the microgrid up is looking at, hey, you don't need to deploy a whole base microgrid at first, just identify your critical loads uh, and then you can scale up microgrids over time. So uh, the Rhone project is, is looking at, you know, how you can combine and interoperate uh, multiple microgrids um, to form a larger microgrid. And then on that page, there are also some tools. There's a microgrid potential explorer, again, using the OMF that people can access. Uh, and uh, a uh, 
map potential explorer, uh, excuse me, microgrid design model using OMF and a microgrid potential explorer that can map out uh, different potential in service territories. So a, a co-op or developer can go in and say, okay, what are the resources that we can use for local generation? What's the, what's the footprint in this area? So that's being built out to, to help folks kind of kick the tires on what might be microgrid potential development in their area. Um, cooperative.com on our website, if you just search for microgrids, you can find these pages or the links uh, that I posted uh, earlier. And I will stop sharing. Excellent, Michael, we appreciate all that update. Um, I think there's a wealth of information that you've offered and, and I think the panelists can feed from uh, any of the material here as points of, uh, points of reference to talk through. But I really wanna kind of uh, now let Josh speak from, um, from the California perspective, from the uh, Southern California Edison perspective and, and how does that relate to um, you know, everything basically that Michael's walked through. Sure. Uh, can you hear me? Absolutely. Yep. You good. So, yeah, lots, lots of great projects that uh, I'd like to learn more about in the in the weeks to come. There. So, I didn't, I didn't pre prepare any slides. I'll just make a few comments uh, there. One is, um, you know, in, in a California context, one of the key uh, things going on right now, as many of you may know, is um, the the challenges we have with with wildfire and the risks associated with that and how does that impact our customers. <clears throat> so a lot of, lot of interest in microgrids, a lot of activity in microgrids in California right now uh, with largely driven by that, right? So there's lots of reasons in general we might think about, you know, where and when and how it might make sense to do a microgrid, a lot of focus right now in, uh, on wildfire and, and, you know, minimizing the impact and to be more specific there, in order to manage uh, wildfire risks or better better manage those risks by reducing the likelihood of starting a fire, one of the tools in our toolbox is to do what's called a public safety power shutoff, where when wind speeds are high, um, such that such that equipment and wires might start you know flying around in the wind, we'll shut the power down in order to to eliminate the likelihood of an ignition event. So. Obviously, that cuts power to our customers. There's, in some instances, with microgrids, perhaps some customers could stay powered when they would otherwise be shut down by that by that event. So, so a, a few things to to kind of build on there. One is back to where we started with the definition of a microgrid. I agree with what Megan said. Uh, I think the ability to connect and disconnect is, is one of the defining features of what a microgrid is, and one of the things that it's also going on in the state of California as we're in the midst of a, the rulemaking process of the Public Utilities Commission uh, to basically establish, you know, rules and regulations that will facilitate the commercialization of microgrids. And the scope has been one of any of the issues that gets debated where, where some issues are brought forward of, uh, you know, how we can extract more values from value from DERs, for example, distributed energy resources. I think we're all in agreement that that's good, uh, but so many of the things that we can do with distributed energy resources don't necessarily require that ability to connect and disconnect. So, you know, from our perspective, that's not necessarily microgrid related. But the, again, that key defining feature is is being able to separate and then reconnect to the to the main grid. Another uh, distinction I would that's important from a utility perspective when we're thinking about you know what is a microgrid and how do we define it, whether we're doing a microgrid that's that's behind the meter or supporting a single you know customer, uh, or whether we're doing a microgrid that includes multiple customers, or what ties those customers together from an electrical perspective is our distribution infrastructure. That's a very important distinction, and has implications you know both technical and 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 commercial and, and how that gets established, uh, implemented and operated. So if we're behind the meter, this, that's something that's, that's doable today. Customers are doing it. We have incentive programs uh, where we're helping customers build microgrids on their premises behind the meters if that's what they like to do. 
we've had we've again in the context of the wildfire risks we have here in California, a lot of that effort's been focused on mitigating uh, that. So we're looking in areas where we have that vulnerability, our customers have that vulnerability of losing power due to a public safety power shutoff, and in particular helping you know, commercial or institutional customers that are able and willing to provide shelter and services to the surrounding community in the event of a public safety power shutoff so that so that you know with our help they can better serve their customers um, you know under those conditions so that's one of the things that our customer service department's been spearheading for a couple of uh, a couple of years now those are behind the meter microgrids the area that i work on more and that i know more about is is on the, what we call front of the meter microgrids or microgrids that would include multiple utility customers and distribution infrastructure that's that's newer right? we're, we're still figuring out you know both as a utility and as a state you know how exactly does that work what are the roles or responsibilities who pays for what um, what's the value of resiliency uh, and etc so a few uh, activities there uh, that I can share and again apologies for not having slides if someone would like more information I can provide my contact info and helpful to, uh, happy to provide more um, one of our key programs uh, is something called the EPIC program, uh, which funds uh, many of the demonstration projects we do uh, with the investor-owned utilities here in California. We have uh, EPIC projects today that are developing and, and will demonstrate capabilities for control and protection for microgrids that include multiple customers and our distribution infrastructure. Um, we one of our projects we want to partner with a city or county government to integrate and optimize the operation of the government's resources and our resources uh, in forming a microgrid for resiliency purposes we have another project where we are working with a transit agency to again uh, integrate and optimize how the tra transit agency charging operations work along with our distribution operations uh, to minimize the need, for example, to upgrade distribution infrastructure to support uh, these new charging loads. One of the things that we're doing as part of this program is <clears throat> developing a common control platform that we can use across these different applications. So in the future, we'll have some economies of scale, whether we're supporting uh, a critical loads at a, at a city government site or whether we're supporting a, a fleet operation we, we're developing and implementing a common control platform that will allow us to support those types of uh, activities we have another pilot project that we've been developing it's back to the wildfire uh, context where we <clears throat> went through an exercise to identify where do we have underground um, infrastructure that we could safely energize during a high wind event that today is shut down because it's affected by upstream overhead infrastructure and that would be an ideal place to create a microgrid to mitigate the impacts of public safety power shutoffs we're developing an opportunity to do a project um, in such an area <clears throat> we're still working through the um, that development process so it remains to be seen whether we'll be able to see that through or not, but we'll know this year. And then one other activity that I think is worth noting is um, back to the Public Utilities Commission microgrid rulemaking process. One of the requirements there is that the California Investor Owned Utilities develop and administer what's being called a microgrid incentive program, or MIP for short. This will be an opportunity for communities. Um, and local governments to come to the IOUs and, and propose microgrid projects uh, that would include, you know, operational um, kind of input and, and support from the from the utility, the front of the meter type microgrid to propose projects. There's a there's an incentive funding that will be available um, for projects that meet the eligibility criteria, uh, and so the rules. In the process for that <clears throat> program under development and will be reviewed and approved this year and so that will i think lead to further growth 
in the area of microgrids in, in California this year and next as that microgrid incentive program rolls out. Uh, one, one last comment uh, back to, I was, I was uh, as Michael was speaking, I was looking at the comments in the, in the chat. Someone asked about use of battery electric vehicles on microgrids. Uh, uh, to, for, you know, obviously that gives you another resource to support uh, load during islanding event and, and a transportable resource of that, which is, which is powerful if we can learn how to harness that. I think that's, that's definitely on our minds. It's something of interest. And one of the, you know, I'd say one example of the benefits of having a common control platform where we're thinking about resiliency and electric transportation uh, adoption integration is as part of a, you know, more, more holistic view on how are we integrating all of these things. And so I believe that the approach that we're taking from a technical perspective will, will facilitate and enable uh, doing things like that. Thank you. Hey, much appreciated, Josh. Um, I think in an area of, of risk is something that's common to all organizations, uh, right? to all whether it be um, right? smaller right. rural communities and co-ops or, or larger um, urban uh, or maybe even critical infrastructure facilities uh, that the Department of Defense manages or others. Um, so I'm curious, you know, Colonel Perkins, work, welcome. Uh, I think you're, welcome. you're now on the panel. And um, panel. if you'd like to kind of offer up some insight into like how, kind of offer up some insight how into you perceive how microgrids being a useful tool. Uh, yeah, yeah, am yeah, I coming through okay? Can you hear me? Yeah, you're coming through now better. Uh, you, you had some type of echo before, but you sound good now. Okay, uh, I, I don't think uh, my uh, camera is gonna be able to work today, but uh, uh, such is the nature of this. So uh, Colonel John Perkins, I've been working with uh, Iowa State University on a series of microgrids. And uh, in our world, what has uh, come up on the microgrid okay. side well, is maybe we microgrid is a form. Didn't get any audio from Colonel Perkins? Is that what we're hearing or not? Not hearing? I'm hearing it, Jake. Oh, yeah, All everybody right. hears it, Jake. But uh, everybody hears it, Jake. But me. Am I am I still good here or not? You're good, Colonel. Keep yeah. on going. Okay. All right. So. Uh, about microgrids is part of what I call the response and, and recovery cycle. Um, in the National Guard, we are, after all local and state uh, authorities are overwhelmed, before national assets such as FEMA or active duty come in in a regional event, our job is to mobilize under the, the auspices of the governor and, uh, and help out. Well, what we've found is as we've ex experienced more, what I would call, re especially in the Midwest, regional disasters, such as the derecho or a large snowstorm or something like that, that are interrupting things, that our, our real job is to ensure that we can actually mobilize, uh, bring critical resources together and project them out. So think of it as a projecting forces out to help the recovery and disaster scenario. So to do that, we are fo uh, focused on resiliency, which is in our definition is be able to island our facility of all utilities, water, electrical, gas, uh, sewer, everything for up to 14 days. As you can imagine, that's a that's a big risk, or a, I should say a big risk, it's a big ask, especially as we're interconnected with much stuff on the civilian side. So what's really driving a lot of that is uh, energy is the primary input of all that. So as if we can uh, do, uh, project ourselves when everything else goes down, uh, that is really our goal. And we look at, you know, uh, resiliency as a form of mitigation for a disa community disaster for our resiliency to be able to respond. Uh, we got to look at the risk levels. So as we talk about risk, you know, I, you know, what happens if my facility is hit with, or my post is hit with a tornado? Real, pretty high probabilities happen about twice in the last four or five years, um, or a flood or something like that. But, you know, it's going to take out a couple of buildings. Then I got to look at the really high risk things that probably will never happen, but if they do, they're critical, uh, such as a Carrington event. So how do I isolate from EMP or even a, a high altitude EMP attack? Um, and then I got to look at all the things that are happening that are more likely 
uh, or higher on the threats or, or threat scenario, uh, such as what happens is what we had to ratio, which is basically a statewide tornado almost, or a winter storm. Or what happens if somebody with a drone dragging a copper wire takes out the local uh, uh, substation connected to my facility? So these are all the things that we look at as far as uh, the risk uh, mitigation on, on those standpoints. So for us, risk mitigation is creating a, a first off, a base-wide microgrid. And in our situation, it's probably about a three megawatt type of uh, microgrid. And for us, there's always a, gen, um, you know, we talk about definition of a microgrid. For our definition, it's a generation source. I have a, a, a some sort of control system. Uh, because I have to isolate all, all my microgrid definitions equals um, having some sort of battery storage on site. And then because I have to operate for such a long time, I have to have a renewable source, which actually extends my fuel supply because engine generation is probably the most likely form of powering a microgrid in an emergency, but uh, that eats up a lot of fuel real quick. So that's kind of what we're, we're looking at from those, that standpoint as far as resiliency. If I go further that in disaster uh, recovery operations, which FEMA really likes to, to and fund mitigation, getting left of the disaster, so to speak, and I understand that. Uh, I've been working with Iowa State University on a series of what's called mobile microgrids that I could load up on a truck in some form of fashion and uh, take and put out in the community that I could power certain community infrastructure. And all the disasters I've been involved with, which have been a lot uh, in my career, unfortunately, um, the ability of, the, of having energy on site to drive pumps for sewage, for water, for to supply electric, electricity to medical devices, to charge cell phones, all those sort of things has been absolutely critical for the recovery, uh, quick recovery of that community. Therefore, the ability to get that out to the community is very, very important. However, I will say, that as we've having you know, derachios and system-wide storms taking out multiple grids at a time, that's become more and more problematic. So the ability for us to pick up a large device that has a battery, a generator, uh, some sort of renewable energy in it, and all the plugology you need to connect everything and deliver it on site has become really key. And uh, so that's an area we've been exploring. I appreciate that. Hopefully you can hear me. I can now hear you. That was the weirdest thing I've ever experienced. Uh, couldn't see any chats, couldn't hear you, couldn't nothing. Um, but I'm back. So appreciate that overview. One of the, appreciate that overview. One of the comments I wanted to kind of bring up, of bring up. Maybe I won't talk. Do you guys hear the same echo? Okay. So one of the comments I wanted to bring up was uh, kind of that interoperability or you know, deployable microgrid assets, plug and play, if you will. Um, are you seeing improvement in areas of standardization for this? Uh, no, <laughs> somebody need, needs to write a national standard for plugology of, of what we need. Um, so one of the problems we come across in the microgrids is I, 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 uh, I, I go back to Dr. Seuss book called, Are You My Mom? And, um, you know, uh, if I have to, uh, for example, uh, go to a local gas station, because it's the only gas station that can pump fuel, it's the only one that doesn't have a thousand trees down by it, to, uh, so people can get their cars and that type of stuff going, or even their generators, uh, how do I plug into that piece of civilian infrastructure that may be uh, 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 480, you know, running three phase or something like that, which is different than uh, I need a, a, a small uh, pallet sized microgrid to put in a community center so somebody can charge their cell phone or even their, their, their insulin pump or something like that. So interoperability, part of it depends on the size of what you want. And uh, then also depends on the plugology. And even among the military, uh, plugology is an issue and of standardization, and then you have the control systems be able to manage this. Um, the inside of, uh, you know, uh, FEMA has like in the fire uh, disaster area, they have very well-defined typecast 
uh, vehicles. So if I need a, a type six wildland fire vehicle and I'm getting it from another agency, I know exactly what the capabilities of a type six wildland fire vehicle are. That has to be established for microgrids and portable devices in disaster recovery, um, just like it does for everything else. Otherwise, we're not going to get there. And then, you know, how much power do I need to draw? How long do I have to draw the power for? That would also help that's a uh, convenience store, which is the community center in a small town, as the only source of fuel, fuel or food, would help the design to say, well, maybe I just need to have my pumps run versus having my freezers run. Um, so um, that, to, to me, it's the interoperability is, is a, is a um, multi-headed gym. Hopefully, I, I, I hit on that. Yeah. I I'd, I'd like to add to that. Um, I think I think plug and play is a <clears throat> is a great uh, term for an aspirational goal. Uh, you know whether we'll truly truly get there. I, you know I think that remains to be seen. But it's something that I think we should all be striving for. Um, I do see you know one of the things that we're doing that I, I think you know we're all doing that's important is to make sure that we're using standard communications protocols. Uh, and so that at least on the communication side, it's, it is plug and play and the different devices can talk to each other. Uh, Colonel Perkins, you know, raises some of the other issues I think make plug and play a little more difficult, especially when you talk about control, when you talk about electrical protection, which is, if you're not familiar with that term, that makes protection is, is how we make sure that if something goes wrong, we don't, we don't kill anyone or blow up any equipment. And so so when you when you're talking about especially and then if you add on the complexity of having resources that are moving around so that every time they're they're utilized maybe they're supporting different loads that that's a different control and protection scheme every time you change your resources and your loads you can it changes your control and protection we're not there yet in terms of having the sophistication to automatically evaluate assess what what's the new you know what are the new resources and loads what therefore should the control and protection schemes be there's a whole area of i think logic and perhaps artificial intelligence that would have to be developed that would that would be required in order to have plug and play on the from a power systems perspective but at a minimum today i think at least from my perspective we're on the right track from having plug and play from a communications protocol perspective, which is. NL has done some work in this area, but it's certainly a, a challenge. Um, one of the things that we've looked at is kind of plug and play for wind particularly, and going back to some of Colonel Perkins' discussions about the deployable batteries and the mobile batteries, we've looked at deployable wind as well, um, turbines that can be loaded up into trailers and, and deployed where they're needed. Um, and we've worked on some specifications uh, for the performance and for the deployment of these types of assets. And I think it particularly comes into play when you have these deployable assets because you know that they're going to be moved around and that one installation is not going to work for, you know, you don't have to just build the one custom installation and leave it there. And I think that kind of speaks to different types of microgrids and the consideration of resilience in that piece. Um, I've seen in the questions too, you know, questions about um, the all hazards approach um, for microgrids. And I think there's a difference between microgrids that are built for clean energy and for added um, local generation versus microgrids that are built specifically for resilience. Um, I think the disaster relief type microgrids and the deployable microgrids you know, we're thinking about what Colonel Perkins is thinking about with the, can we be islanded for 14 days or more? Um, and can we be islanded with all these systems um, versus some other microgrids that I think, you know, maybe are more typically deployed by utilities or others where it's kind of more about, um, you know, can I produce my own local power? Um, can I get those clean energy benefits? Um, and I think it speaks too to the type of how do we measure the resilience and how do we value the resilience so that um, we can build resilience into all of these deployments, not just the ones that are specifically for disaster relief. 
Um, so another area of work that Cornell has is on resilience um, metrics and resilience processes. Um, we've looked at that again specifically for wind, but it's really a lot more broadly applicable. Um, and part of that too has been evaluation component. So how do we assign dollar values to these? It's very difficult with the resilience events, which you know we might typically think of as high impact, low frequency type events. And so doing the risk analysis for those, assigning probabilities to very unusual and unique scenarios. You know, is it a tornado that takes down my distribution line? Is it a tornado that takes out my substation? Those are all going to have different impacts and different probabilities. So it can be difficult to kind of assess what is the value of resilience in those scenarios. Um, and so one of the ways that we've found to do that is just through kind of simple cost avoided metrics and associated risk probabilities. Um, we've worked, done some work with PNNL to look at the avoided costs of certain resilience hazards um, in microgrids, both for the customers and for the utilities, for the providers. Um, and even that is a difficult task to do. Typically the uh, customer impacts, the known values for those or the known costs for those are for more reliability type events, uh, one hour to one day to maybe three days um, of outages. And so when we start talking about seven day or 14 day um, disconnections from a utility, it's a lot harder to um, even have accurate values on what that costs uh, the customer and, and therefore what are the avoided costs if we're able to provide the resilience through a microgrid. Um, not offering solutions here, just more perspectives on, on uh, what we're looking at when we think about resilience and microgrids. Well, this is Carl Perkins here. I, I think uh, both uh, Josh and Megan really hit on it. It's a matter of talking about scale. Uh, most of the stuff we're talking about are systems level microgrids. And a lot of the, uh, and when I work with industry, uh, they approach it very much from a utility standpoint. Uh, my holy grail of microgrid is uh, batteries in a bucket that maybe is charged by a solar panel when I'm not nobody else is looking, and that I can keep my refrigerator up and running for maybe a period of three days uh, during that first 72 hours uh, 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 during a disaster, so the food doesn't spoil. That I don't create a food emergency uh, beyond uh, the already going on disaster. Because uh, as the longer energy is down, the more uh, cascading needs that you build up in a civilian population. Um, so I, again, it's it's a matter of scale, but I think we can approach this both from a very high level down to you know like my facility dropping off uh, the the grid and uh, supporting itself down to how does that individual support that microgrid, or how do I take a pallet of energy uh, to a community center? that works for 48 hours uh, that I don't have to deliver a G diesel generator so they can charge their phones and their medical devices and I don't have to deliver fuel. Uh, and then I can exchange that uh, battery pack out as a part of a regular uh, type of resupply. So uh, yeah, there's a lot of work to be done in, in type what I call typing and scale. And one thing I'll add is, is on the load side, you know, identifying what is a critical load uh, is a challenge that we found in some of these projects, um, say at a military facility or at a campus, uh, there might be some disagreement, but what load is critical, especially if you're scaling, you're not doing a whole facility microgrid, you're really trying to identify, especially if you're doing a smaller scale microgrid first and looking to build over time. So figuring out what those critical loads are. And then the other challenge is if there's not uh, advanced metering infrastructure to know the load shape, of those particular individual portions within a larger facility, if say the metering is usually just been at the whole facility level, then it's it's a challenge to, to figure out you know what the load shape is you need to meet with these on-site resources. So data is is a critical component um, and something that's uh, you know needed if you're going to scale and build a microgrid to meet those needs. Um, and depending on where you are. It, be more challenging than in other places. Hey, Jake, it's Sherry. Pardon the interruption. I uh, just wanted to mention to the panelists, we have a ton of questions in the chat. If you guys could at some point take a look at those, maybe you'll want to answer those offline and 
or just even establish, um, you know, a line of communication with some of these questioners, that would be great. We have a hard stop at 1220, but uh, I encourage you guys to keep going until then. And then I'll abruptly cut you off <laughs> if, if we don't do it more gracefully, but this is certainly interesting. A lot of people want to know, so keep talking. Yeah, I appreciate that, Sherry. And, and unfortunately, I, I cannot see an update in the chat or questions or anything. So uh, I don't know what's happening. But um, yeah, please, panelists, as you see questions in the chat, if you can see them, um, take a stab at answering a couple of them. Uh, type your email address into the chat. Let those who are asking those questions um, maybe reach out to you offline as well. Uh, it is, this is Josh. I'll, I'll... I'll put my email address in too, but one of the questions I think it's easier to at least introduce it verbally is the questions about business. So one of the things that we did when we were looking for, for where it would make sense to do a, a, a multi-customer microgrid to mitigate the impacts of public safety power shutoffs, we were we were looking at you know basically you know impact in terms of customer minutes of interruption. So so there's a power shutoff. That we have so many minutes of customer, you know, customer minutes of interruption. What difference do we make with the microgrid? One of the things that was hard that's hard to predict there is, is what assumptions do we make in terms of future, you know, high wind events? And and how do we think about how our operational procedures in the absence of a microgrid would evolve? So in, in light of other measures that we're taking. So there's Many things that we're doing on the grid that are also are, that are also increasing resiliency, or 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 we'll sometimes use the term grid hardening. For example, we're replacing a lot of bare wire, overhead wire, with covered conductor. When we make that replacement, our thresholds for when we shut the power off in terms of wind speed goes up. Right. So now we have to think about where are we putting in the covered conductor? When are we putting it in? What will the new wind speed thresholds be? In, in many sites that we looked at, with the bare wire upstream of a of an isolatable, if that's a term, a load block, uh, the microwave makes sense. Once the covered conductor goes in, it doesn't, because now the customer minutes of interaction would be less. So that's one of the things that we looked at. And then when you want to put everything in terms of dollars uh, to make a business decision, then you then you have to put a monetary value on those customer minutes of interruption and we've referenced value of service studies that have been done in the past. Um, that opens up a whole new you know, area of, of discussion and debate as, as you know, whether what numbers you use and do they make sense and, you know, and so forth. But anyways, a few comments on that subject. Josh, thanks for, for taking that question. Uh, Jake, I'm afraid we're gonna have to bring it in here and move into our break. Like I mentioned before, folks, there, there is going to be a, a short video recording on CCE if you're still curious about that. But before we get to that, I wanna thank you, Jake, and thank all your panelists. Uh, obviously, once you get a look at the chat, you'll see there's been a tremendous amount of interest about this topic, and I think a desire to continue to engage on this. So, so thanks to all of you for this. I appreciate your time today. Yeah, I'll echo that, Sherry. Appreciate the opportunity to put the panel together. Uh, we may need our own workshop. Uh, I think these panelists have a lot to say, and the questions that I can't see seem to be coming in. So uh, <laughs> thanks again. We'll save them for you, Jake. All right. Thank you. Fantastic job, panelists. Nice job, guys. Thank you.